All right, guys, we are back Wednesday evening. We got a very special guest. We have Jeff Clark. He's the lead systems engineer for Odyssey. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm great. Happy to be here. Awesome. You know, we were just talking backstage. I can't believe you've been around. You've been with Odyssey since 2005. Yep. Pretty yep. much when I went out there and visited you guys, when Chris Kerikakis was there and we did mm -hmm. a whole article. I don't think we ever met face to face, despite the fact that you've been with the company that long. Yeah, yeah, maybe not, but uh, it's been yeah, it's been a it's been a great ride. It's been they've been uh, hiding you in the back room, haven't they? I uh, yeah, I mean, I started out you know just doing software, and and now I'm uh, running some of the projects, so yeah. some of the big ones. Well, cool. So Odyssey's been through a lot of iterations over the years. You know, you had the the editor app for the phone. Mm -hmm. Now you recently announced the PC app, the Odyssey Multi Q X. Very excited about that. That opens up a lot of opportunities for people, you know, because a lot of the room correction systems today, they are PC based and they allow you to do a lot of adjustability for people that really want to go in and dial it in. Mm -hmm. Now this puts you on equal playing field that you have this kind of interface for people. And you've got some other upgrades that we're going to be talking about, especially I got this right here. This is on, we just posted a press release on it. You guys now have a calibrated microphone with a serial number. That's right. It looks just looks just like the regular microphone that comes with the Denon or um, Marantz receivers. So maybe talk a little bit about this. Why do we need this microphone, this calibrated microphone with Odyssey Multi Q X, as opposed to just the regular microphone that comes with the AVR? Yeah, um, the regular microphone that comes with the AVR, it, it's very very good. Uh, we get um, every single one of those is tested off the assembly line. It's tested to meet our specification that um, it's corrected for in the AVR. So all of the AVRs come with a baked in, built in correction curve for the generalized correction curve for the microphones in general. The microphone that comes in the box, it matches that correction curve very well. But there's assembly line tolerances, there have to be. And um, that's where the ACM1X come is, comes in. So this is a microphone that's measured against our type one reference microphone it's um, a calibration file is generated and your multi qx software can download that directly from the internet and um, perfect your calibration so it leaves nothing on the table takes takes all the variables out of the equation when you're measuring so basically you download this PC software and you're going to be given, kind of giving us a tutorial on it, but mm -hmm. you download the PC software, then you, you, you buy this mic and you type in the serial number and that's when it it's using it's the calibration basically for this. That's mic, right. right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And these, these microphones work as a, a regular calibration microphone for the, the AVR. So they meet the same standard. If you didn't use the calibration curve, you would still get a very good calibration um they just take it that extra extra la last last little bit now how does this relate to be between getting this microphone versus your pro calibration kit which i have right here yeah comes in a really nice bag um is this going to be available to the public as well for multi qx so the, the the pro calibration kit has a, a long history um, with the company, and it was it was something we introduced way back, and we worked with our old software called MultiQ Pro, um, mm -hmm. and that software was very pro oriented, um, installers only, and um, what we saw as an opportunity was to to bring that kind of control to the enthusiasts and everyone. So the pro kit was very expensive. I think um, uh, you know I'm. It's it's been sold through retail channels, so it's hard to say what the what the exact price would be now. But um, it was expensive. Most people would look at that and say, "Well, I'm going to calibrate a few times. I don't need to go in with um, the big kit. The big kit comes with a microphone stand, so that's nice. Mm -hmm. Comes with a preamp, and you can drive a cable up to a kilometer. We'll talk about some of that some more later. Later, but." Um, it's not really any different, ultimately, in the quality of the calibration or in the in the precision than that little microphone that's been calibrated. So they're both calibrated in the same way. Um, the mic uh, is plugs directly into the AVR. The kit you have to assemble some cables. Um, they're just kind of two different ways about the same thing. 
Yeah, so the, this comes with a mic preamp, so it allows you to drive a longer cable, basically, than what the mic preamp is in the Denon or Marantz receiver. Right. If you want to extend the cable on the little uh, pyramid mic, um, you can do that. We recommend against it, but if you have to, you can extend it with maybe one extension cable, say 25 feet, and that's usually going to be okay, but you want to try and buy a high-quality extension cable, and that's a tough one because who really knows what a high quality extension cable is unless mm. somebody's tested it and qualified it. Um, you can't, some of the ones on Amazon are great. Some of them are not. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Yep. All right. So um, I know you prepared a slide presentation and mm -hmm. you're going to talk about the new features of multi -Q X, and I'm going to let you get into that. And then what we'll do is if I come up with some questions as you're giving the presentation, I'll try not to interrupt you too much, but I, I might. Uh, yeah, I can't please. guarantee that, no, but, um, okay. at the end of the session, maybe we'll take some of the questions here. Um, guys, if don't forget about the super chat, if you really want to stand out here and we'll, um, we'll try to get some of these questions answers as well. Cause I know there's a lot of questions going on now about the multi QX. So hopefully we can get that all covered within the hour. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, hopefully we can get into some tips and tricks, uh, with multi QX some of the things mm -hmm. that, uh, maybe aren't so obvious. So, but yeah, we'll start with the presentation. So uh, here we go. The, uh, so this is us. We are yep. here to announce our uh, Multi-QX and especially the ACM1X. So we've, we've announced Multi-QX. It's been out a little while. The response to it has been great. But um, for those who don't know, uh, the company was founded out of USC uh, by a handful of researchers who really set about with the, the guidance of Tom Holman to create an automatic system to do what Tom was doing manually in theaters and taking hours and hours and hours to do it and special expensive equipment. So they set out to create a more automated system. And you may recognize the name Tomlinson Holman. He was uh, the yep. inventor of THX, um, has gone on to do a bunch of other great things. and. Uh, um, but has always been uh, sort of a mentor of mine in particular, I think. So can so, I give you a quick, can I give you a quick history story before you move on? Yeah. So how I met Chris um, is back with the 5805 when that first came out and we're talking 2005, just when you're showing there. Um, I tested the 5805 and I ran Odyssey and it wasn't doing anything on the subwoofer channel. And then they found out there was an implementation issue with the hardware. So they had to go back and they had to change a bunch of stuff in the software. And that's when I got involved and I met Chris and I started talking to you guys. So that was like, you guys were making on the fly changes for the very first generation of room correction. I just thought that was, you know, it was a cool story. And that's how I got involved with Chris. And then you guys sent me the, the separate calibrated box. You used to have your own standalone box. That's right. The, yeah. The uh, sound equalizer. Very yep. simple name. Uh, still, awesome, still get questions about that one. Still have people coming, uh, looking for the software and the and the tools to calibrate it. It was a killer unit. It really was. But yeah. anyway, I digress. I'll let you get back. Not at all. Uh, it's uh. So we did this. We did. We did the uh, the the like you said the fifty eight oh five. That was like the first flagship model that we started out in, and it was definitely dynamic times. Um, and since then we've um expanded the line, it added some technologies, and um, ultimately uh, IMAX theaters picked us up and were used in, in calibrating most of the IMAX theaters that are installed. So we also, um, so we'll talk, we also do some other categories. Uh, we work in automotive, we work in mobile audio, and home theater and movie theater are, are a little bit different, but not too different. Uh, not so different that the same technologies um, aren't serving both. So we, we have basically this same implementation that goes to movie theaters and, and home theater. Um, as it says, we're, uh, our goal is to deliver research-based audio technology. So we all of our technologies have research behind them and we'll talk maybe a little bit about some of that. Um, and bring as close to a reference experience in any setting. So the basic technologies most people are familiar with, multi-Q, uh, that is our room equalization. Dynamic EQ is a technology that you have, um, 
you have you you rarely listen at reference level. So movie theaters try, they don't always play quite at reference level, but they play pretty close to reference level. And when you turn the volume down, you may notice the emphasis goes away. It doesn't feel like uh, the sound has as great of an impact. And this used to be called a loudness control. A loudness control was kind of a brute force, one size fits all um, mm -hmm. button. Dynamic EQ takes this and it accounts for everything. It accounts for the volume setting. It accounts for the level of the content. So the level of the content matters. And it calculates all of these parameters and it feeds them into a psychoacoustic model and determines what tonal balance adjustments are required to bring the the character of the the content back. Um, so that's one the um, one of my personal favorites. Dynamic volume. Um, you would again when you turn the the level down, there's content that's very quiet. If you turn the level down, that content that's very quiet kind of falls off the bottom. You just don't hear it. So dynamic volume is actually uh, uh, helpful in a lot of cases. People often turn it off. It's like, I don't need uh, dynamic range compression. Well, um, a little bit can help. So dynamic volume on, on light is a, is a good setting when you're not listening at reference. Um, if you are listening ref at reference, then you, yes, you, you probably don't need dynamic volume. Will that help uh, people that can't hear the dialogue too much at, when the volume is down? It can, yes, yes. It's, um, it can, it won't do too much to the mix. So overall, if the mix is um, has is kind of weak in the center channel or or something like that, then still bumping up the center level might be the best option. But it does take into account the content across all of the channels in determining how it uh, adjusts. Mm -hmm. One way to think of it is it's like a smart volume control. So as we were talking about the research based aspect of these. What we did was we looked at what people did when they took control of the movie mix and they were listening at quieter levels and they remixed the movies. So we had a whole bunch of people uh, come in and basically remix movies. And what dynamic volume does is it just adjusts the volume control like they would, but before you have a chance to feel like you need to. So it's kind of hands-free listening. Um, low frequency containment, if you don't wanna bother your neighbors, uh, it'll reduce the lowest frequencies that carry through walls, but it'll synthesize a, um, a version of those frequencies that gives you some of the impact still, so they're not completely gone. So it's a high, it's a high pass filter, but it maybe it, it, it gives a boost at certain frequencies that don't have very long wavelengths that go through the walls, right? Not just a boost, but, um, but a remapping of those fundamentals into their harmonics so that uh so that they're still there and they they can give a sense of a phantom fundamental if you've heard that uh, expression it um will you still feel like they're those frequencies are there even though they're actually not um interesting yeah so uh, that's uh one that uh, is is more of a yeah more of a compromise in the listening um but it if it lets the baby sleep and lets you enjoy your movies, then then that's a that's a win for all of us. Um, embedded technology, so we do come say kind of some interesting things outside of this. We love the XT on uh, things, so we've got Base XT, which allows us to put a very um, powerful woofer in a small enclosure and still uh, achieve good low frequencies. So people who are playing with designing their own speakers will know that. You put a woofer in a small enclosure, it makes it very hard to produce uh, the low frequencies. Volume XT, we take to a lot of mobile devices and it uh, allows us to maximize the volume capability of the device without running into distortion. So some other things we do. Um, so we uh, skipped one. So the history of the, the, the component we're here to talk about today is, um, multi -Q X that came out of the multi -Q pro our original pro software and then the multi -Q editor so we've got screenshots here and um the Otis the multi -Q pro is uh installer only and it's just gotten a little clunky in this day and age also about five years ago we transitioned to a mobile editor mobile software editor and that actually people don't necessarily know this but 
that's actually published by Denon and Marantz. So that it's exclusive to Denon and Marantz. Um, it's actually their software, but it's our technology. So they packaged up our technology inside the app and, um, and they publish it. So um, we'll refer a lot of questions about that to Denon and Marantz. Um, if it's the technology, we answer the question. If it's the app itself, it's, it's uh, something we pass on to them. I will tell you on that app, um, it's very difficult to use through a phone that mm -hmm. if you're going to use it, it needs to be done on an iPad. It's hard to, it's hard to move those sliders with your finger on a phone. At least, at least my fingers, I have fat fingers for a small phone. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We recommend using a tablet, uh, that can help, but even then, um, it's, it's, it can be a little tricky. So one thing I have to mention here, really important that we're announcing is that as of uh, June 15th, we'll be discontinuing MultiQ Pro. So until then, people will be able to buy licenses for the old Pro software, but we, we have to discontinue it. Um, it's no longer really, um, it's taking some time and effort to maintain, but it's not actually uh, creating value anymore. So it's um, it's a challenge to have to do this, but We'll, what we'll do is we'll make sure that all of the licensed AVRs are still able to be calibrated with the software. So as long as the software keeps working, as long as you know the, the OS doesn't break it, the software will continue to work and you can still calibrate those old AVRs. Um, those who use the software might recall that it, it you have to download a key from our website in order mm -hmm. to use it. So, um, so with that, we have MultiQX. Um, hopefully most of your listeners are familiar with this by now, but in a nutshell, uh, we saw the opportunity to bring those features that the, that the pro users had to the enthusiast. We saw an opportunity to uh, put a fresh UI around it, do some more, um, uh, some creative UI development to, to make a, a more compelling user experience, make it easy to use, but also super powerful. And most of all, control. So people can override lots of the defaults, override some of the, override some of the automatic settings that are part of the calibration uh, when you're calibrating with the built-in or with the app. So this is available, uh, downloadable now in the uh, in the Microsoft Store. So you can you can go out to the website, and it looks like this. You can just click get and you'll be able to download that software. And the and the price is 199 on that? That's right. That's the that's the the license cost for uh, for the software. And for for calibrating as many times as you want one AVR. So we'll talk we we'll talk a little more about the licensing structure later, but it's uh, um, something that came out of our our pro install market as um uh, something that was easy for people to work with that were in that market so one of the things we're doing with multi qx is we are supporting both professionals and enthusiasts um since there's not really a, a way to differentiate those markets and who has what software we uh we try to do our best to serve them both with the, the one software um so there it is, the, the uh, AVRs that are supported, there's over 50 AVRs. Um, here's a big chart. It's the first time we've put together this complete chart. What this yeah. is showing is the Denon and Marantz AVRs that are supported today. Um, and the way I've coded this chart is the AVRs on the right, the bold AVRs have both MultiQX T32, and they have a capacity that we'll talk about a little more later, which is MultiQX enables them to measure individual channels. So you don't have to measure all of, you know, 11 or however many channels you've got in each position. You can go through and pick and choose how many of each, how many measurements you want to take for each individual channel, and you can take them one at a time. So if you want to know what does it do to the measurement, if I tow my speaker in, you, you can go ahead and um, try it with the speaker you know, straight on and then try it with it towed in and see, and see what the difference is. So the AVRs in green are XT32 AVRs that don't measure individual channels. 
the AVRs in orange have uh, multi-Q XT. And the AVRs in the sort of gray area are supported, but they are um, multi-Q AVRs. So they don't have uh, the level of correction that an XT or XT32 AVR has. Um, and what that means is you probably aren't going to get the most out of multi-QX with those AVRs. So uh, those are mostly uh, um, very sort of budget-oriented AVRs, and they're most of them are fantastic, but they, um, they aren't going to see the benefit that you would um, with some of the upper spec AVRs. Um, the, for each level, there is actually a pretty dramatic increase in the calibration uh, correcting power. So the increase from X, from base multi-Q to multi-Q XT is a very large step. And then from XT to XT32 is even a, a bigger step. Full frequency or just a, a more resolution in the base or what? More resolution in the base is, uh, is the, is the answer there. So yeah. it's, um, they all do the full spectrum. All both multi-Q and multi-Q XT have, um, improved resolution on the subwoofer channel. Multi-QXT has more, but they both have more resolution on the, in the low frequencies on the subwoofer channel. So on those AVRs, I recommend people base manage a little more aggressively. So you let the subwoofer be corrected and base manage a little more aggressively. So move the frequency up and, um, and you can sometimes get a little better calibration out of it. While the XT32 AVRs have the same low frequency a resolution across all channels. So uh, we already talked about the ACM1X. Uh, this is available right now on Amazon. And currently, this is important, it is only available for multi-QX users. So there's no way to use this. If you use this microphone with your AVR, directly and use the built-in calibration, it won't give you anything, any any benefit. It's just going to use the same calibration curve that's already built into the AVR. Um, I think customers will pretty quickly ask like, okay, can I get the calibration file? Can I use this with Roo? At this time, we're not putting the calibration files out. They're directly used by our software. And mm -hmm. that's really just so that our multi-QX users get first shot at the supply of microphones. So if there's demand, if we see people asking for uh, these microphones, then then we'll we'll I think we'll we'll look for a way to open that up and make it available to people because it's um, a pretty cost effective solution for an electric condenser microphone. So not a little MEMS microphone, but a, a dedicated quarter inch capsule, high quality, very consistent capsules, um, and uh, it's something I think we a lot of people will find other uses for. But for now, right. multi-QX only. Yeah, cool. So we talked about uh, the Pro Kit. Um, another thing we've just introduced is an adapter cable. So we've got this guy down here is our new adapter cable. And it's made to allow the people who already own a Pro Kit to plug that pro kit into the front of the AVR, just like the, the consumer microphone, just mm -hmm. like the, the pyramid microphone. Um, the advantage is, as we mentioned before, a kilometer of cable. So your, your distance woes are over. If you need to go uh, a kilometer, you can do that. Um, but why do we plug into the AVR? It, it's precision. It gives us the most precision possible. So when you plug into the AVR, the output and the input are clocked so they're all on the same digital system and what that means is we can be very precise with the timing and we can we can do something kind of special which are people wonder why we use our our specific test tone this repeating we call it a chirp um, it's a logarithmically swept sign and it repeats over and over because we're canceling the background noise so what that enables us to do is differentiate especially at the low frequencies where that kind of noise can be a problem. Um, it allows us to better differentiate what is background noise from where the speaker is rolling off. So we are able to detect the cutoff of the speaker more accurately, um, detect distances, levels, everything 
uh, more accurately. So this is, little cable is not just a little adapter. So users who have a pro kit should not just go buy an adapter. They should buy this cable because it contains electronics to make sure that the signal from the preamp is correctly adapted to the, the front of the AVR input. How long is the cable for the extension cable in the pro calibrator box? You said you pro, could do a thousand feet, but what do you guys give us by default? Uh, the the, uh, the default, I believe, is about it's either seventy five or ninety feet. I think they're twenty five foot cables, and it give and it comes with three of them. Oh, okay. So the pro kit is not currently available for sale. Uh, we are working to make those available again. So right now, the only market for those is sort of the secondary market, the Ebays, the the forum classifieds, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully we'll have those again soon. Um, but it's a uh, and we'll, it'll depend on what the demand is. With the new calibrated individual microphone, um, the Pyramid microphone, there's a lot less need for this kit. But a pro installer still would want to go in with a more durable system, something that's a little more going to take a little more abuse, maybe than the than the consumer microphone. Um, comes with a professional stand and um, some high quality cables. So yeah, overall, I mean, it looks you just look more professional walking into a client's place with a big, you know, case like this, and you just it, exactly. it looks awesome. Yeah, yeah, I totally see the appeal of that. So multi QX. Uh, I wanted to go through, give people some um, some pointers. Start at the beginning. Um, I've already bypassed sort of the opening screens here, but they just allow you to open a file, which I've done here. Um, and uh, yeah, are there are there any things you think uh, that I missed in the presentation so far, Gene? No, I think we're we're moving along pretty well. All right. So the um, multi-QX is PC only right now. So that's uh, kind of uh, something we might give, be able to rectify in, this, in the future, um, improve. It'll, it'll depend on demand. So everything we're doing going forward with multi-QX is sort of driven by our, our customers and what consumers and in pro installers are asking us for. So we've brought the first set of features out. And, and we're we're adding on to it as as quickly as we can. So, so oh, quick question for you: When you add that. features, when you add features, is this something that we have to now go to the app store to update, or is it would you get a notice through Windows like, hey, there's a new feature for the yeah, software? Yeah. Windows will automatically keep you up to date as long as you let it, unless you've specifically disabled that feature. Uh, it'll just automatically update. So. The only time we run into trouble with that is sometimes uh, it won't give you the update quite right away. So there are definitely um, users out there who have the previous version and they won't see some of the, the latest features, one of which is the ability to download a mic cal file. So we'll run through that really quick. If you don't okay. see those features, you can go to the store, and the Microsoft store and force an update. Right. So the first thing to do before you even get here is to go into your AVR and go to the amp assign and set up the channels that you want. So that's that's step number one that we're not showing here. Um, the user guide is available right here. Um, it's a pretty involved user guide, so there's quite a bit of information. It's, we try to focus on on the the substance of the information that uh, people will find useful, and some kind of some theory, some um, different aspects of the calibration that might people might not find obvious. So it's actually a really great resource for just learning about how the system works. But once you go to the amp assign on your AVR, then you can connect after you've set whatever channels you want present. And in this case, I'll connect to the um, sample AVR because this is an offline. I don't want to, you can see my, my Marantz is here, my 7704. Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. this is my living room and this is, uh, let's, that's my AVR, and actually the measurements that we'll go through are from that. So there are also going to be some mismatches in here um, because I calibrated with a different set of channels. So, so if somebody wants to just go in and only correct their subs, they can mm -hmm. just deselect all the other channels, select the subwoofer one or two channels if there's two, if your model has two sub uh, independent subs, 
and it'll just run the correction just for the base? It will not allow you to deselect the fronts. So the fronts are required. Okay. Um, you should be able to do that. You should be able to do, like, say, just the fronts, but you can also bypass the fronts another way, and I'll show that in just a second. So you could always disable case, the correction afterwards, too. That's true. Well, if you want to calibrate only like certain pairs of channels or certain individual channels, I'll, I'll show how we do that. Um, because if you, um, you can disable the correction afterwards, but um, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a few different ways to go about it. So, so you set up your channels here, you decide what channels are present. I'm not going to bother with surround backs right now. Um, and then we move on. So to adjusting the subwoofer levels, this is actually kind of cool and maybe I should, demo it. Maybe we'll come back to it later if we have time. But what this does is it shows you a real-time SPL of your subwoofers based on a narrow, the narrowband pink noise. And this allows you to pre-level align your subwoofers so that um, they're going to be in a reasonable range for trims. Now, people want to know, people often ask, like, is there, val is there an ideal trim? And Yes and no. So depending on your setup, I actually like to have a little bit of positive trims on my subwoofers. So I'll set this maybe just a little on the low side. And the reason I do that is I want to make sure that there's uh, minimal um, noise in the system. So you can turn down the subwoofer. So most of the time, this isn't a problem, but I've run into a few environments where the subwoofer has a little hum to it. But if you turn down the volume knob, it goes away. So if you if you do have that problem, you can start a little low. It'll compensate for it in the trims, and um, and you'll end up with a, a minimal noise in the system. So, so Jeff, I have a quick question for you. Anytime I ran this, and I have not run it on multi QX, so forgive my ignorance here. Mm -hmm. um, but anytime I've ran where it tells you to set the subwoofers to like seventy five dB, it always seems like it wanted me to set the subs too low, about four or five dB too low when I hit the target on that. Is there a reason um, for why it's doing that? Because I always had to go back after the calibration and kind of turn the subwoofer levels up a few dB. And on, I'm not the on, only one that's said that. I've seen other people say that too. Sure, there, there are a couple of different things. And I think we'll come back to that a little later as well. But in this case, all, all we're doing is we're setting the subs pre-level. So we want to get them in a range where they're correctable to within a few dB of each other. Right. Um, if it comes out a little low here, that's good, especially if you have two subwoofers, because when you add them together during the measurement process, they'll they'll combine additively in the room, and you'll end up with um, a louder signal. So uh, with respect to the actual calibration of the trims, um, Again, we'll talk a little more about that in a second because there's a, the few points, finer points of that that I want to uh, to go over. So the next step here is to perform your measurements. And this is gonna come up with all of my measurements pre-populated because um, I've already taken a whole bunch of pictures or a whole bunch of measurements. So I did the, I forget how many of this was, um, now, what's the resolution on these measurements? I know back in the in the old days when Odyssey would show you these before and after graphs, it was heavily smoothed. It wasn't very realistic on what you would measure without smoothing. But these look much more high resolution. What are we looking at here? Right. We have the ability to zoom in and um, we, we give you the full resolution of our measurement signal, which is about 2.9 hertz. Mm -hmm. So if I turn off the smoothing entirely, you can see it gets... Yeah. pretty crazy up here and it's actually kind of limited by the display in this case because we we don't show all of the you know thousands of points that are that are in this region because we would um performance reasons really it just would over over be overkill but um what you can see in the low frequencies is actually point by point um measurement and the and the resolution that's available you can so, conceivably use this system now to to make real measurements of your system without even having to use REW, right? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it'll tell you. Yeah, it makes it pretty transparent what's going on. There's not. Oh, I'm covering up the uh, the smoothing slider here. So here's the the data smoothing. So I can turn it off, wow, turn it on, awesome. and and you can 
you know, we're we're hoping to do more development around this, get more zooming, uh, more detail, lots yeah. of things yeah. that um, we'd like to do. But for now, we're focused on taking the measurements so that we get our aggregate response um, as as close to representing the area as possible. So you notice here, if I turn down the smoothing, the individual measurement responses get um, more jagged, but the the aggregate view does not. So the aggregate stays relatively smooth. If I turn off smoothing entirely, it's much less jagged than those individual ones. And that's because over the course of taking all of these measurements, um, this is the what we've ascertained best represents the the speaker system and speaker room system as a whole. Yeah, it's like it's averaging the response, right? Yeah, and it's in a simple and a little more complicated than that. We do make some um, some sort of what we hope are clever choices in there, but it is um, pretty close to in most cases to an average. Um, so one thing I could ask in a future iteration where you have the data smoothing slider, mm -hmm. it would be great if it actually showed you like what the resolution is, like one twelfth octave, one twenty fourth octave, that kind of thing. You know, definitely. Um, it's you know that's a there's. We're, our features are driven by our, our requests, and so that's um, that was a high one, high priority for us as well. And actually, I thought it was going to be in there, but it didn't quite make it into into release. So what you can do with the measurements, you'll see my subwoofers are grayed out because I measured on a system that had subwoofer one and two, mm -hmm. but the system that I'm that I'm using now does not have. Uh, uh, the subwoofer one plus two it is based on a um, uh, single subwoofer. And so if we went over there, we'd see that the subwoofer is blank on this one. Um, let's see if I can do that. There we go. So if I drag over, the subwoofer is currently unmeasured. But what I could do is I can go in and I can measure an individual channel. And your it's head, going your head's to. Your head chopped off now, by the way. Uh, yeah. There. there you go. <laughs> Thanks. So it'll measure an individual channel. I can measure the subwoofer and just fill it in and move the microphone around. And um, it, now I've got something to correct. In this case, uh, it's based on some canned measurements that are, I don't know if that's a subwoofer. <laughs> but A couple uh, of questions I have for you on, on what it's doing with the sub. So let's say you have yeah. a model that has multi-sub, two subs, two independent mm -hmm. subs. Yeah. Uh, when I was talking with Chris years ago uh, about how to manage multi-sub, we both kind of came to the same conclusion when he was here visiting the Audio Hulk's uh, original home theater room, mm -hmm. that you want to measure the delays and the levels of each sub separately. And then apply, after you get all that aligned properly, then you apply EQ to both simultaneously. Right. Is that still true today and what the software is doing? Is it going to individually calculate the distance and, mm -hmm. and the levels and then apply a correction to the summed response of the subs? That's right. And you'll hear that in the in the measurement. So you'll hear the measurement. It'll it'll chirp one subwoofer. So it'll play the, the chirp, chirp, chirp noise on one. It'll play the chirp, chirp, chirp noise on the other. And those first measurements are to get those trims and distances for the first position measurement. It then measures both of them together. And then you, when you proceed to your second, third, fourth, fifth uh, measurements, it'll just measure both of them together. Because after that, you can of course only set one set of trims, one set of distances. So they're yeah. set for the primary listening position. And then we do the EQ measurement over a range of positions. So one of the things people wanna know a lot of times is where do I measure? So I'm on a couch here, and you can, um, you want to measure where your ears are. So you want to measure, if that's near a boundary, you can run into some issues. So you want to maybe come out a little bit, but not necessarily. Yeah. So it depends on where you really listen. If you listen near a boundary, that's, you know, that's, that's a tough thing, but that's where your ears are. So I try to balance it. I'll try to take a couple of measurements, like, uh towards the back towards where i'm kind of normally listening normally i'm probably slouched down a little more 
Um, and then sometimes, you know, I'm kind of critically listening. I'm kind of up here sitting forward like I am talking to you. And that's an important place to measure as well, because we don't want to overfocus our measurements on just one really narrow spot. Um, we can over EQ. We can we got the resolution, so we can we can do too much and to the really to the detriment of all of the space around those little points where your ears are. So, and if nothing else, we have two ears most most of the time, and um, that's at least two positions. So, never leave the microphone in one position. Another right. pointer: don't handhold the microphone. <laughs> that timing precision. Uh, it's there are other systems where you can. Ours ha uses that repeated chirp to cancel the background noise, and in order to do that, it has to be perfectly still. So, so always uh, put it on a tripod. Put it on the cardboard stand that comes with the AVR. Um, if you don't have something else, um, a little camera tripod works great. It's got the quarter inch um, screw in the bottom yeah. of it and uh, gives you a lot of flexibility in how you measure. But another on a couch point. like this, yeah. Uh, oh, another point. I don't know if you watched the video that I did with Teo Nicolakis, who's actually in the chat right now. Uh, we did a whole video on Odyssey. And okay. we were talking about when you set up your mic positions, you want to keep the other positions within about a three foot radius of the main listener position. So some people would think if you've got an L shaped couch, you can put a couple of positions at the main listening area, then go all the way to the side couch and do measurements there. And it's just, that's not really how it works. If you're going to try to calibrate for a vastly different area of the room, you should have a different preset for that. Yes. Right. That is, I, I would agree. Um, if you're, if you're regular listening, regularly listening with you know people on both parts of the couch, then what I would do is I would I would do sort of a broad EQ where I do measure maybe one or two positions over there, but the majority across the the um, sort of primary facing area of the couch, um, and then the other option the other I, option is to create a, a sweet spot. So especially with the new AVRs that have these dual presets, it's a fantastic feature. Yeah, We'll also show you how to do that with MultiQX. So you can actually now um, use the two presets that are built into the older AVRs. So they both have a, they have a preset called flat and they have a preset called reference. And those are, um, previously those were uh, computed by Odyssey for you, but we now give you control over those. So, few other features before we move on on the measurement page you can delete the positions you can decide i don't really want to use these positions but i don't want to delete them i want to maybe try some different things with my calibration so if i want to do two different presets where i measured two different sets of positions i can measure them all in one file then i can go through and exclude this position and it will not be taken into account in the aggregate so it'll go ahead and um, disable that row. So we'll move on to designing the target curve because this is one where people have a lot of questions. Um, what we give you from the start is the default. And even in this project file, I have overridden some of the settings. So the default is a high frequency roll off. And this is based on the translation from a th the, the acoustics of a theater to an average living room. So the high frequency roll off is, is uh, a good estimate that works in most cases. In some cases, you might find that based on personal preference or based on your room, you might want a little more roll off, a little less. So there are a couple other options there. If you have a true full on theater, you can use what's called SMPTE 202M. That's uh, called the X curve. And it's a very, very big roll off. Um, our mid-range compensation is included in, by default for both flat and reference. And we'll talk about why that is. So back on the measurements page, you'll look, and this is a speaker system that is a, it's a dome tweeter and a cone mid-range, cone, cone mid-woofer, large, large-ish, six, eight-inch woofer. And if we look at that response, we've got the center channel, it's got, a dip around two kilohertz. We can go back um, and we can see in there the uh, the left and right 
Let's see if I can get back there. Dealing with multiple monitors, but the left and right, they have the same thing as this, this dip around two kilohertz. Now it's possible that that's room acoustics, but pretty unlikely. It's possible that that was an accident, but based on our experience, pretty unlikely. Those are, um, those are there because there's a change in directivity between the tweeter and the midwoofer. The midwoofer shoots the sound kind of straight out. It doesn't tend to disperse in, it doesn't tend to have as wide a dispersion as the tweeter, which has very broad dispersion at the low end of its range. Um, and so I think the speaker designers have, uh, have in a lot of cases built that in. Now, if you have a different set, kind of set of speakers, something that has maybe a dome mid-range or smaller mid-range, or it has ribbon tweeter or um, planers, all kinds of other types of speakers that don't fall into this cone midwoofer, dome tweeter crossing over around two kilohertz, then you might want to choose. Uh, you might you would choose to disable the mid-range compensation. Yeah, because I, I will tell you that a lot of the newer speaker designs, like you know whether it's Revel or Perlison or any of the guys that use waveguides and have smaller drivers to to hand off the the transition frequencies, mm -hmm. they don't tend to have that two kilohertz dip. So yeah. I, I definitely would suggest to people to look at the measurements if we reviewed a product or if another magazine is actually has anechoic measurements of the product. Mm -hmm. See if that dip is there before you check that box, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, especially, yeah, especially if you're, you're dealing with something other than traditional cone, mid, cone, cone, uh, cones and domes, right? Yeah. If, it's, if it's anything different than... Um, and I actually, I kind of think we'll see uh, some community involvement around the target curve and around designing different target curves that work well with different speakers. I think there's an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you do want, what you can do is each of these target curve options can be applied separately to the reference preset or the flat preset. So if you want to sort of A, B something different, um, you can choose which one it's applied to. So we can make flat into um, a reference roll off by clicking that. And now you can see on the output, this is the target curve. So in this case now, they're both the same. So I've made them uh, the same. Normally we have a flat and a reference because reference tends to be for sort of reference movie content, which is mixed to a reference, whereas a lot of music is not. So um, it just gives you two options to on how to approach the sound. Uh, in some cases, there are a lot of film soundtracks that already have a sort of high frequency roll off applied. So if you saw a film that said it was re-EQ um, ha had already been applied, then you would want to switch to the flat preset in the AVR. Mm -hmm. So from there, we have our uh, biquad parametrics. So there's all different sorts of biquad parametric options in here that you can use. And these are, again, these aren't filters. So we're not adding a filter to the system. The system is always FIR based. So an FIR is a finite impulse response. And that means that it doesn't ring forever. So it doesn't use feedback like a, like a parametric EQ normally does. But what we do is we take the frequency response of that parametric EQ and we transfer it and encode it into our multi q FIR filters. So what we're designing here is the target sound. These are not filters that go into the response. They don't affect the response directly. We're just designing our target. So we'll move on to, uh, and maybe we'll come back to some of these advanced features in the cutoff mode a little later. So, so if, uh, if somebody just wants to get this um, software, and they don't want, let's say the receiver's in another room and they don't want to go through the calibration because they can't reach the mic. Mm -hmm. Can they just get the software and do manual correction on their on their base? That's just right, by they using can. Those filters? Yeah, so if you go into the measurements, and I won't do this now because it would take a while. It's kind of uh, a little slow with this big project. But if I go through and I exclude all of the positions or just don't take any measurements at all, then what you'll see on this page, on the filter settings page, Mm -hmm. um, which allows me to preview uh, before and after 
is you'll see a flat response is your before. Right. And then when you design in your target curve, what you'll see is your after is just the exact parametric EQ that you put in. So what this page is showing us is before, after, and what the filter is. And again, we can control the smoothing. And what a lot of people have been interested in is this high frequency limit. So if we drag this high frequency limit down, um, it seems like it's going to be a little laggy. It, it limits the correction to, to whatever, go. Yeah. You'll see that the the correction is no longer happening. The after it becomes the same as the before. The filter itself does nothing. So if you decide that um, you want to EQ only below, say, the shorter frequency, you can go ahead and do that here. Hmm. So the other option you have, and this is kind of an interesting one, is say your speakers are maybe detected, and it says, OK, your speakers were detected at 80, but you know, you know they really play down to 60. You can come in and you can override this and you can bring the low end up or down. So you'll see as I move this that it's doing less and less correction on the low end. And so by default, MultiQ has to protect your speakers. So we have to assume that your speakers can't produce any more output below their, their uh, detected cutoff. And so by default, this won't do any EQ. But if I decide, yeah, you know what? I know these speakers can handle some boost. So let's go let's go down here and, and let them uh, fill in. I can go back to my target curve. I can move the low frequency of the target curve. So again, this is this is the target roll off, not the filter that we're applying, but the target roll off. So we want to match. Is that the different than the, is that different than when I go into the AVR and change the crossovers for each of the channels? It is, and it can be, but it probably shouldn't be. And so what we'll see. What's new in this version of MultiQX that we just released is that when you set it to auto and you override your base management, it will match this cutoff to your base management frequency. And when it does that, it will create a Linkwitz Riley crossover. So, getting way into the deep technical stuff here, mm -hmm. but a Linkwitz Riley crossover is an everywhere in phase crossover. So, we want to crossover from the the main speaker to the subwoofer in a phase coherent way and that's what is accomplished here so we we conform that speaker to a second order roll off and when it uh when we eq it that way it now has this smooth roll off that works with the bass manager in the avr to create that linkwitz riley alignment so here what i've done is i've gone a little bit nuts and given it this big boost here it's not really going to do anything on the speaker because that speaker is already rolling off so hard anyway. But and probably we don't want to allow it to put a big boost below the low end of that speaker yeah. because, well, first of all, yes, because of the crossover, um, it's not going to be very audible. And second of all, like if it does get content down there, it's it's going to be detrimental to the speaker potentially. It might overdrive it, distort. We don't want to do that. So we have a question. I've seen this though often. I figure it's important to ask. Mm -hmm. When will the FIR filters be able to be imported from REW? FIR filters is an interesting option. Right now, we're hard at work on our next version. will include RU parametric EQ import. Um, but the FIRs are interesting. So one of the things, so what are, are one of our proprietary technologies is a way to run extremely long FIR filters in a very um, efficient way. So I'll have to look and see if they're what you know what the root format is, what it looks like, how it's computed, and if our um, if our system will work in you know coherently with it because we don't want to import something that isn't going to get represented properly. So gotcha. um, but that's a Definitely an interesting, another option that might be um, just as useful to people would be to be able to import a points, set of points, frequency mm -hmm. points in the target curve so that you just say, this is what I want my EQ to be. And you put in your frequency response and it just does that. So that's uh, one option. The other thing, there are some other components of our filters. So 
we don't want to over boost the system because of digital clipping, digital headroom that's available in the AVR. So you'll see here, like there's some of these that are actually limited and you might see it even more if I turn down the smoothing. Um, so if you try to over, over boost, you would run into clipping in the AVR. The AVR is designed with a very specific headroom allowance for, um, for our multi-queue system. So we design our filters to adhere to that so that you're assured that there's no uh, artifacts from the EQ other than just fixing the room acoustic problems or the EQ that you are targeting here. What's the max boost on Odyssey? Is it plus nine? Nine dB. And that's yeah. that can sort of depend because the the filter is level aligned in the 500 to two kilohertz region. What that means is we try to make it so that when you turn the filter on and off, there's minimal level difference between 500 to two kilohertz on average. It's EQ. It's going to boost some places and, and cut others. Right. So um, what it looks like a boost in the 500 to two kilohertz region will be pulled down um, to level align it. And that's because we have, we want our parameters, our level and distance parameters, our trim parameter to be um, correct, regardless of whether the EQ is on or off. So one of the things you asked, and I'm gonna go back and I'm going to start at the beginning and do a new project. One of the things you'll see if we go straight back in, if we we can go straight back to the filter settings and we should have a, we have a blank slate, right? So right. this is what I was talking about, where if you put in EQ in the target curve, but you don't actually take any measurements, then what you're you're, you're shifting your mode of thinking and what you see is what you what you get. So um, in that case, you'll notice here that with mid-range compensation, because it's in this 500 to 2K region, it actually puts a, the rest of the, the response about a dB up. So with the respect to the sub trims, I, I currently am recommending everybody if if you just want a reference experience and if you're using dynamic eq which gives you a low frequency boost automatically you still should go in and just bump up the subwoofer about a db um, most people have already done this if they haven't bumped it up one db they've bumped it up three which is fine personal preference and maybe the way your person your room and your acoustics respond can give you a little bit of different perception of how the low frequency response is um, if you prefer not to use dynamic EQ for um, other reasons, you want more control, you don't want the dynamic uh, aspect of it, then you definitely are going to want a boost in the low frequencies, or if not by designing your own target curve, then certainly by just adjusting the trims upward. So a question I have for you on all this, if I design my own target curve without running the correction, mm -hmm. yep. and then I save the target curve, can I can I use dynamic EQ and dynamic volume, or or does it, does it expect to have a FIR corrected curve from Odyssey? You can. Um, it's just like they'll still work if you change the trims. Um, it won't be necessarily out of the box what we think is right. So based on the the technology, the way we've designed it, it's designed to work around uh, seventy five dB SPL on a specific uh, type of pink noise. Unfortunately, the built-in AVR pink noise doesn't always match our specific right. frequency response. So one of these days, I hope we'll, we'll publish our own pink noise. Um, but until then, um, we, we consider that the trims calculated from the measurements are sort of authoritative. Like they, the measurement has extreme resolution and it will, um, and it's incredibly precise. So when I use our type one SPL meter um, with you know traceable standards, I I'm seeing you know it's a tenth of a dB off at the most, and that's so usually that's a, used for error. It's an interesting point you bring up because I've I've seen this before. You go and you run Odyssey, and then you go and use the internal pink noise of your receiver, and you go to level match, and they're not level matched. They could be mm -hmm. off a dB or two. Yeah, and then oh, you just think Odyssey is not doing it correct, but 
the pink noise bypasses whatever EQ you're using. So if you, you can't actually use the internal pink noise after you run Odyssey to make sure that your speakers are all properly level matched, the way to do it would be to use an external pink noise generator, like a test disc mm -hmm. or some type of pattern. Right. Yeah, it, it, because the because the the filter is level aligned according to our notion of what pink noise is, um, it, it's it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a guess. So we try to make it so that the it wouldn't matter whether the EQ was on or off. But again, if the AVR pink noise is different, then all bets are off. So generally, this gets you good spectral alignment between the subwoofer. Aside from this one dB that I that I suggest, you know, out of the box. Sure, bump it up a dB um, if you're using dynamic EQ to, to compensate for uh, the low frequencies. So uh, we haven't we've kind of glossed over some of the things that I hope to get a little more detail out of. Yeah, you can okay. go. You can go. We, uh, we um, I'll gloss through the last few things, the calibration settings. Um, in this case, I'm uh, connected to the AVR, but... Um, my sample AVR, and there aren't any trims or distances because I haven't measured anything, and it's telling me that there nothing's detected. But that's okay. I can go in and I can set manual trims if I want to. Jeff, I, I don't set... see. We don't see your screen. We just see. Your... Ah, sorry. Yep. Thanks. So here we go. I can go in and I can set. Uh, I can tr switch between auto and manual. I can switch between auto and manual in the distance. I can switch between um auto and manual on the base management so this is where if i change this um i can't actually set these because they weren't detected but if i go back and measure yeah so so if you run an odyssey calibration i've noticed this if you have a speaker close to a wall like a surround speaker the boundary is creating the illusion that that speaker has more bass than it really does mm -hmm. And Odyssey tends to set that speaker large or it sets a crossover right. of like 40 hertz. So that's when you would go in and hit the manual and set the bass management to small or raise the crossover frequency, right? Correct. Correct. And if a, if I go in and I set this to a um, little, there we go, 60, so smaller center channel, and then... When we go back to our target curve, the automatic target curve detection should pick that up, assuming I'm running the right version here. Um, I think I'm I'm running an older version that actually doesn't have this. So the latest version in the store does have this, but being the, one of the developers, you know, I'm not I'm not getting that. So, um, so. If you do have an older version, then you should go back and you should set this to override and you should make this match. By default, you should make this match your your um, base management frequency. Oh, that's the front. I did pick it up. I was just looking at the wrong one. So I changed, I changed the center in this round to 60, but the fronts were still on 30. Everything was working. Um, so could you potentially bypass the receiver's base management if you don't want to use a 12 dB per octave high pass and customize it with Odyssey? You would, yeah, you would not be able to do that because you would have no way to get your content to the subwoofer. So if you, if the base uh, management... Well, yeah, it won't sum correctly. It won't, well, you'll, won't if you recombine. set your speaker to large, many people run into this already, which is, and maybe this is the reason for like LFE plus main mode. It is, but yeah. If you have, you know, your stereo content and you have front large speakers, and you, um, maybe they do go down to, you know, thirty, but you're missing your subwoofer action, then you've got to turn on. You've got to have some way to get the content to the subwoofer, and that's where the the AVR is built in. Um, bass managers still needed. So. Um, so final final step here is to go ahead and transfer this. And if you have an AVR with multiple presets, it'll ask you when you click transfer if you want to set it to preset one or preset two. And um, we've got settings here. Now it's important to note these are not online settings. These are sort of um, these are transferred to the AVR when you click transfer. So they will only be applied when you click transfer. But um, we have some advanced features. 
for reference level offset. So that's a that gives you the ability to kind of change when dynamic EQ works. So if you if you change this and move it up to 5, 10 dB, then that basically will make it so that dynamic EQ is working at a 10, 10 dB different reference level. So uh, music, which might be mixed a lot louder, um, you don't want dynamic EQ boosting as much when you turn the volume down. Um, and so that's what this allows you to do. Low frequency containment amount, dynamic volume mode, I like to set it to low. Um, and the default target curve, so you have reference flat and the Denon's and the Marantz's offer a bypass, so it bypasses the left and right front. So you only EQ the surrounds. Um, so that's that's the software in, in uh, more than a few words. So <laughs> quite a, not even a deep a lot, dive. It's, a lot to take. It's, a, it's definitely a lot to take in. You know, it this is. is not this is not something that you're going to just download and, and instantly become an expert on. You're going to have to True. do a lot of experimenting. And I'm hoping in the coming months, you know, with with Teo's help and I'm going to get involved and maybe even Matthew Pose and we're going to do a series of little videos on how to optimize Odyssey Multi QX. And hopefully you can watch those videos and then give us some pointers if we're missing something or. I'd you know. be happy to happy to join you. Happy to uh, to answer your questions along the way. Um, for our users out there who do have questions, this is an important one. They they help in right here in the application. It will take you um, directly to our help site to ask us. So this is sort of a um, something that we're making ourselves super available to people so that um, they can get the answers that they need. Uh, and that's where we'll start to maintain some of the um, frequently asked questions, that kind of thing. Uh, those aren't up yet, but we're trying to get those up on our on our help desk site to make it easier for people to, to uh, learn what they need to know. So I guess the, the last question I have about the licensing thing, because I know I've, I've been seeing people popping up questions about the limitation of it being only mm -hmm. for one device or for one computer. Right. Um, if I buy this license for, let's say I have a Denon um, 3807 or whatever, the, you know, the 3700 model, I'm sorry. There I get, yeah. get models confused. Yep, yep. Um, so if I sell that receiver to someone now, they can't use, they can't use that license, right? I mean, that's, that's only for the laptop that you put it on for that model, or can they still transfer that license since it's still for that receiver to another laptop? The license is per user and AVR. So it's both associated with the user account and the AVR. And right now there's no way to transfer it, um, nor can we actually transfer the license from uh, like your old AVR to your new one. So, so if someone set up a generic Gmail account instead of using a personal one, I mean, they could potentially just for that purpose, they could transfer that license to a new user if they bought that receiver, right? That's conceivable. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, so the reason the licensing is the way it is is because we never charge an upgrade fee for the software. Right. So we want everyone to have the greatest, latest software all the time. We don't want to have to manage different versions and say, you get this and you get that. Um, but we didn't like the idea of charging people like a monthly fee or something like that, like a subscription service. Those things, I think, mostly drive us nuts. So if yeah. you're the, the person who you know upgrades their, their AVR every few years, um, then I don't think it's a, a major burden to, to say, look, the software has progressed in these couple of years. Um, relicense the new AVR. Likewise, somebody who might be buying your old AVR has never purchased a license. Um, they haven't uh, sort of supported the software development. So it's sort of fair to ask them to to be part of um, a supporter of, of the software. So we're trying to do some pretty great things. We have um, uh, some, new tip, tip, some new tricks up our sleeves that we want to put into this software to make the calibration even better. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, uh, we're excited to keep working on that, but uh, all of that work doesn't doesn't come for free. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So, couple of couple of questions here. Someone's asking about: um, Is it going to be available for Mac? 
right now this is just PC, right? It is based on cross-platform technology, so we hope that we'll be able to do that. It is, unfortunately, still a pretty massive undertaking, so um, it'll depend on on where we see the market moving and where um, and how many requests we get. So, by all means, uh, log your requests. What we need to know is that if we if we put in the substantial development effort to do that, that um, you know it'll be worth it. And yeah, because of course we want to. Um, but it, we have limited bandwidth, so we get to choose in a lot of cases, you know, do we improve the software that's already out there or do we take it to a new platform? And it's, gotcha. it's a hard choices sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Here's the next question. If a speaker has a fourth order roll off in the measurements and we override the cutoff for fourth order, does the auto on crossovers raise the crossover to compensate for the AVRS Linkwitz Riley filter? So, if you make your target a fourth order, then what you're asking is that your speaker look like a fourth order roll off um, to the whole system. So you'll have a fourth order roll off from your target curve and in your speaker, and then you'll have a second order high pass from, yeah, from, from the, the base electrical. manager. Yeah. So uh, you'll have too steep of a of a of a roll off on your on your main speaker. Um, so what I what I advise is move the crossover up, so that you're because your your speaker is rolling off steeply. What we want to do is move the move the crossover up, which will also automatically if you leave it in auto, it'll automatically um, apply that second order high pass uh, target response in multi queue, and then everything will work coherently together. Gotcha. Then we've got. Um... This is an interesting question. I think you kind of addressed this earlier, but my right speakers are close to boundaries. Will there be a time in the future where one could create target curves for individual speakers instead of pairs? So the that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, the answer is yes. Um, as part of our RU import, we'll be allowing separate EQ of left and right speakers as well as in that case it works as a target curve separate target curve on the flip side if you do have a boundary that might be something that you want to correct for so um stereo imaging comes from a good match of the left yeah. and right speakers and correcting for the boundary can can improve your imaging and when you're talking about correcting for the boundary this is a very important point we're talking about this backstage mm -hmm. Some people think you could just get an EQ system like Odyssey, D-Rack, whatever, and you don't have to do anything with the room acoustics because the auto EQ is going to fix everything. And mm -hmm. you and I both know that's not the case. If you give these systems a better room and you give these systems better speaker placement, then they're going to be more functional and they're going to be doing more useful correction for you because they can't overcome At the end of the day, they can't overcome a speaker in a bad location. Right, they can't overcome a room with a high RT sixty time because then they they can't differentiate what it's measuring for the direct energy versus the excessive reflected energy. What do you think about that, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, you can see I've got uh, some diffusers above me, and there's some on the on the front wall as well, um, and that's because I have a room with these flat parallel walls, and mm -hmm. it just ref the reflection uh, between the two. It just um, you can just hear it flutter. Um, and those actually aren't enough. I would like to have, I would like to do some more. Um, Interesting those that you put diffusion behind you when you're so close. Usually you put absorption when you're that close to a back wall. Yeah, I could use some more um, in general of, of or combo. treatments, but, uh, but the, a combination would work well, especially lower. But um, the, yeah, it, the room is not even where I want it. So, uh, does multi queue completely fix what's missing here? Well, the, the big, still the big uh, flat wrist reflections. Uh, it's not possible. It's not. So we can compensate to a certain degree for it, but um, but making it like it never happened, we can't. So um, it's definitely a, these things go hand in hand. So you do what you can and what you can uh, afford it either uh, financially or based on your decorating requirements, you do what you can with room acoustics, uh, mm. room treatments, and then you run run multi-queue and, and let it uh, 
take it as far as it can after that. So I have a suggestion for another future update. And mm -hmm. this is a wish list, of course, but yes. talking about the room acoustics, it would be really neat if the system can actually measure the room acoustics from your main speakers and tell you what the RT60 decay is yeah, and then give you a range that you should be in for best eff effectiveness in the room. So if it measures 900 milliseconds, maybe it says, you know, add some more absorption to the room, get within a target. Mm -hmm. That way the room correction system could, can be even better for you. I think that would be a useful tool so people could see the time domain behavior of their rooms. Yes. So we do have impulse responses. So our, our system is a time-based measurement system. And so we have access or the ability to calculate some of that information. It's just a matter of um, development Graphic time and, and putting it, it in yeah. there. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, definitely something. And showing the impulse responses will probably come even first. So you can just sort of either guesstimate um, but if we if we're showing them, we might be calculating RT60 by that point. Yeah, awesome. Well, Jeff, I appreciate you dropping all this knowledge on us, guys. Uh, the Multi Q X software is now available through the Play Store. That's really the only way you can get it at this point, right? Uh, yeah, this is in the Microsoft Store. So right. the uh, I'm sorry, the Play Store is Apple. <laughs> yes, uh, Google. <laughs> but. Um, but here you go, you can, uh, and I can make these slides available so you can't see the link here, but if you do go to the Microsoft Store in uh, Windows 10, Windows 11, and search for MultiQX, you'll yep. find it. The I'll put a link in the description of the video. I also put a link for the, uh, the ACM1X microphone through our Amazon affiliate. That's in the description below. Mm -hmm. If you guys decide to uh, pick that up, it's there. Sounds good. And uh, there's also the the cable, the installer kit cable, which we can make sure we get, get you a link for that as well. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, we appreciate it, Jeff. We're going to have you back for sure after Teo runs through his calibration and I run through mine. I'm sure we're both going to have questions for you. It's going to be a learning experience for us all. We're pushing sure. we're in the bleeding edge of technology here with room correction. So Yes. So thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics or just ask questions. And again, it was great having Jeff from Odyssey on here, guys. Give me some comments down below if you guys are Odyssey users, if you have their latest PC software. How did it work for you? You know, what are the before and after experiences? And maybe if you ask some questions in the comments, maybe Jeff can sneak back and and fill in some of those questions and help us out there. I'm putting you on the spot, Jeff. <laughs> I'll do what I can. All right. Well, until next time, my friends, keep listening.